Let's look at part two here. Um, the Bible has been misused, misquoted, misunderstood, and deliberately twisted in this world to either say things that aren't there or to defend something that's indefensible. And so um, as much as you think that our current modern day world loves twisting scripture, I will tell you this, it's nothing new. In fact, 95 years ago, a guy by the name of Hitler used scriptures in his speeches. He gave a speech in Munich where he quoted Jesus from Revelation chapter 3 when Jesus said, hey, if you're neither hot or cold, I'll spew you out of my mouth. But Hitler twisted that and said that these politicians that weren't on board with his radical agenda as he was rising to power, when they were on board, they're neither hot or cold. They should be spewed out of office, right? And he, used, uh, he also used scripture to give himself the, uh, make himself appear more Christian to Germany, which was a Christian nation. I mean, this is the home of Martin Luther, okay? They're very much, uh, not, I'm not saying every person in Germany is Christian, but they have a, a Christian worldview, and especially at that time. So he used scripture. And I love how modern day scoffers and skeptics like to say that Hitler used the Bible. Hitler quoted the Bible. Well, if quoting the Bible makes you a Christian, by, then by their logic, Satan is a Christian. Okay, Satan quoted the Bible. Big deal. The devil was the king at twisting scripture. He's the original twister of scripture. So today we're going to look at four, five, and six, or one, two, and three, if, if this is your first week here. But number four here, the best defense is to go on offense. And if you apply all of these rules to the things you hear about, the things that come up in your social media feed, the things that you watch on Christian television, the things that you hear on Christian radio stations, if you apply these things to, the, to those things that seem fishy or uh, cause suspicion, then I think you will, this will be the best tactic you can take. So the first one here, if you have your notes, it says, take the Bible seriously in every literary style. Now, the Bible uses pretty much every style of literature that's out there. It even uses styles of literature that we don't use anymore, okay? Like the book of Revelation is a style of literature that we don't use with all these symbols and different things like that. The Bible also uses hyperbole. We use hyperbole every day. It's exaggerating something to make a point. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 23, verse 24, he said, you blind guides, you strain out a gnat to swallow a camel. That cannot possibly be literal, can it? No, because what is Jesus saying here? He's saying you care about the most insignificant things and you ignore huge glaring sin. That's Jesus' point. The Bible uses metaphors. We've preached a series on the I am's of Jesus, and here's one from John chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Now, you see there that's highlighted. He says he's the bread of life. Is Jesus really saying that he is literally bread? That he's the gingerbread man? It's gingerbread Jesus right? No. He's saying that he is life. And if you follow him and trust in him, you will find life and not just life, but eternal life. Amen? Amen. Now, because the Bible uses every literary style, not every passage in the Bible is to be taken 100% literally. So sometimes, not often, but sometimes people ask me if I take the Bible literally. <laughs> Okay, and I always, if someone asks me that, I always tell them I take the Bible seriously. See, because we live in a culture, whether you like it or not, that is becoming less and less biblically literate. They know less and less, and they hear only bits and pieces of the Bible that late night comedians mention or that show up in a social media feed to disparage the uh, Christians. So they hear less and less. So when I hear that, that kind of tips me off that, yeah, they might be asking if I believe in the account of creation or maybe, you know, Noah or big events like the Exodus or Tower of Babel, right? 
But I think usually when they ask me, do you take the Bible literally, they have heard that somewhere in this Bible, it says to stone people who are sinful. And so they want to know, do you think people should be killed, you know, because of their sinfulness? And so they don't know the big picture of the Bible. And if they did, they would come, if they read through the Old Testament, got to the New Testament, got to John chapter 8, they would see Jesus being confronted with this by the Pharisees. In John chapter 8, there's a woman caught in adultery, okay? Now, think about this. That rule was in effect. Someone who was caught in adultery should be stoned. But yet the Pharisees knew where this woman was. They knew where she was. And they knew when she was in the act. Hmm, how is that possible? So they found this woman in the act of committing adultery, and they drug her out naked. Where's the John? Where's the guy? The guy? Nowhere to be found. So they drag her out and throw her in the public square naked. And they say, hey, she should be stoned. And Jesus, who ushers in God's kingdom... In in human flesh, he comes and he gives a new command. In John chapter 8, verse 7, he says, He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And so when Jesus comes, when God comes, and sometimes he gives a new command, that doesn't contradict what was in, in place before that. That's God giving a new command. It's not a contradiction. And so if people would read their Bible, and if you would read your Bible, you would know that when people try to come at you on those things. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Okay, just so everyone knows, Jesus is using strong figurative language to warn you about the seriousness of sin. Okay, and he wants you to take drastic steps, if necessary, to stop sinning. So you need, and we all should, give the Bible the same literary freedom that every other book in this planet gets. Every other book that's written gets those kind of uh, freedoms attached to it. And we should attach that to this Bible, and we should also attach it to the words of Jesus because people try to twist Jesus' words to make him appear more violent or oppressive than he is. Now, I know someone uh, who took the words of Matthew chapter 5 seriously. Not literally, okay? We call him lefty. He was, uh, really took the Bible serious. Now, I know someone who took the Bible seriously, and he took, they took the words of Jesus seriously, and they were involved in so many things, sinful-wise, that they felt like they couldn't get out of it. So what did they do? They moved out of state to get away from all of the people that they, they, they felt connected and trapped to in sin. That's pretty drastic. I believe that is the heart of what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 5. So the next thing I want you to know this morning is we don't make our theology or our doctrine or like a worldview or a principle, you don't do that off of one verse. I'm not saying it isn't possible, but usually you use other verses to back that up. You know, when you read this Bible, there's lots of stories. When you get to the end of them, they don't exactly tell you the moral at the end. Okay, when you're reading through the book of Judges and the book of Judges said that everybody did what was right in their own eyes, there was no leadership and you see all these crazy things happening. When you get to the end of Samson's life, when he's blind and now crushed to death, it doesn't say, and that's why you should stay away from prostitutes, (laughs) right? It's not there. Why is that? Because God knows you are smarter than that. You don't need that there. Okay, and so the Bible doesn't have to spell everything out for you to get the big picture. And the Bible is about the big picture. And so when the Bible was written, there were no chapters or verses. And I know that seems obvious first, you know, just so you know, there were no chapters and verses. That means when you read things, you typically read them in context. 
because you read the letter to the Corinthians. And that's a really long letter, okay? But in order to provide convenience, many, many hundreds of years later, we added chapters and verses. Positive. It's way easier to find something, right? Negative. It allows us to take verses out of context, does it not? So I wrote a simple letter to my wife, and I'm going to show it up here. Don't look away. Don't look away. <laughs> I'm going to show it up here and show you as an example. And this letter, I will read it. It says, Dear Michelle, I love you so much. I love being with you. You drive me crazy. Crazy to be with you. Crazy when I am without you. There will never be a time that I don't want to be with you. Love always, Rusty. So this is my letter to Michelle. So in order to save time and make it easier to find different passages, I've added chapters and, and verses, okay? Yeah. And so now that there's chapters and verses in my letter to Michelle, I'm going to take it straight out of context, okay? So here's the same letter, same words, but let, did you happen to notice my letter to Michelle, chapter 1, verse 3? Look at this. That guy's got a lot of nerve. Did you see that? What a jerk. Let me tell you something. I knew him before he met her, and he was already a whole lot of crazy. Okay? <laughs> Amen. Yes. I don't disagree. So you see how easily it's done with a simple letter, with only five verses. People are doing that to the Bible all the time, all the time. Now, you can read a passage from Jesus in Mark uh, or Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, that says this, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Yeah, let's start another crusade, right? There's a lot of migrants coming in. We got to watch out. Who's with me? Okay, I don't, I just shouldn't even have said that because there's always someone that'll, yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, I'm glad nobody yelled, yeah, okay, I'd, been, I'd have felt bad. All right, so listen, that's Matthew chapter 10. The same author, the gospel according to Matthew, in, in chapter 26, Jesus says this, put away your sword. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. So which verse is right? Here's the answer. Both of them are right. Okay, are they a contradiction? No, because you have to read them in context. If you read that first verse, you know that Jesus is speaking figuratively here, and he's saying, and I bet many of you have felt this after you've come to faith in Christ, but he's saying when you come to faith in Christ, yes, you have eternal life, but sometimes that causes conflict in your families. How many of you have personally felt Matthew 10, 34 in your life figuratively, when you came to Christ, like, I don't know what happened. I, I, I decided to become a follower of Jesus, and now all my friends are mad at me. They don't like me the same. People at work get annoyed with me because I'm cranking Amy Grant, okay? <laughs> what happened? What happened? Because Jesus, coming to Jesus doesn't always bring peace in our world, does it? It doesn't. So if you make a rule or a doctrine out of just that verse up there and you twist it, you're going to be in trouble. Here's another verse, Mark chapter 16, verses 18. In Matthew chapter 28, this would be like the parallel uh, passage where Jesus has risen from the grave and he's given instructions to his disciples. And it says this, it's talking about believers. They will pick up snakes with their hands and... It will not hurt them at all. Now, if you don't know this, if you, if you keep reading through the Gospels and you get to, to the book of Acts, and Acts chapter 28, Paul is on this island called Malta, and they decide they're going to get a fire going. And so there's a fire going here, and Paul is collecting all these sticks. So he's got a bundle of sticks, and he's walking to the fire with this bundle of sticks, and out from the bundle of sticks comes a viper and pff, bites him on the hand injects him with venom, and he shakes the viper off into the flames, right? So all of the natives, all of the people from this island are watching and waiting. This dude, they say it, if you look in there, this dude must be a murderer or something because the gods are angry, right? So they're just waiting. 
And seconds go by. Seconds turn into minutes. And minutes turn into hours. And then they realize, man, there is something amazing about this guy. It went from this guy is cursed to, whoa, this guy is blessed. So Paul is fulfilling what Jesus is actually saying here, okay? Now, there are a few Pentecostals a little south of us who've taken this verse straight out of context, okay? And no, I'm not talking about New Life Assembly of God. Keep going, okay, out of the state. And, you know, there are a handful of these people left, and they keep dying out. I don't know how that happens, but... So listen, Satan twisted the scriptures in Matthew chapter 4, and he tried to get Jesus to jump off a building. We, we talked about that last week. And Jesus always responds to Satan's attacks with scripture. He quoted Deuteronomy 6.16, don't put God to a test. Let me tell you something. If you didn't already know this, let me let, let you know. Grabbing rattlesnakes on purpose is putting God to the test. Can I get an agreement on that? Okay, okay. So notice when you read Matthew chapter 4, listen to this. Jesus used scripture to defeat twisted scripture, okay? That's just a sub point there. But, but the Bible is about the big picture, okay? And so when you read a single verse online, see, Satan took a verse out of context, to twist it. And so when you read a single verse online that seems odd or you're, you're watching a Christian program where it, the, the, the teaching just doesn't seem to line up with the rest of Scripture, that's how you measure it. Always ask, what does the big picture of the Bible say about this verse or this teaching? And so I can give you a positive example. Um, you know, taking one verse out of context is bad, but the Assemblies of God uh, is our fellowship. There's 11,000 or plus, it might be even more than that, just in America, 11,000 congregations. In the world, there's over 50 million assemblies of God. So you have a lot of brothers and sisters that are close to you, okay? We have, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, but these are really close, okay? So there's 50 million or so, and the assemblies of God decided a long time ago, hey, what makes us unique? What makes us unique? And so they came up with 16 fundamental truths. And some of those truths are like, we believe that the Bible still allows healing. That healing didn't go away when the disciples died. And, and people can testify that healing still goes on, right? And so some denominations, they're not too hip on that. They, they don't, you know, play, they, they, they kind of play that down. And another thing we read is there are many scriptures that across the New Testament that seem to point that there is a thing called the baptism of the Spirit. It is different than getting baptized in water, and you can see that in the scriptures. It's, it's different than God's Spirit uh, coming in you when you become a Christian. It is a completely separate thing. And we can show you all the scriptures that back that up. And so that's doing it right. That's how it should be done. We did not come up with any of these fundamental truths based on a single obscure verse. Okay? That's important when you're, when you're making a worldview based off the Bible. And so real quick, I'm going to shift gears completely and I want to tell you a story. I'd like to tell you about a very horrible person. Her name is Eleanor, but she goes by Ella. And those that are closest to her actually have nicknamed her Cinder Ella because a cinder is a hot piece of coal that can catch on fire. And Cinderella is a firecracker of rebelliousness. See, she has a cat, and her cat's name is Lucifer. She literally named her cat after the devil, the father of lies. And so where Cinderella lives, there was a prince in search of a bride. And he sent out invitations to a, a royal ball for all eligible brides to come. Well, Cinderella's stepmother said that she could go to this ball if she got her chores done. So Cinderella started scheming on how she could go. 
So Cinderella decided not to do her chores. Instead, she listed, uh, enlisted others to help her, Jacques and Gus. They helped her. They did her chores. And so uh, she decided also she used magic and dark arts to turn a pumpkin into a, a carriage that got her to the ball. And through her deception, she deluded and tricked the prince into falling madly in love with her. And even though her stepsisters were trying to pursue this prince and the royal ball, uh, Cinderella swooped in with her deception and she tricked the prince into liking her instead of her sisters. And her scheme eventually helps her to marry this prince. And let me give you a quote from Cinderella's stepmother in this story. Cinderella's stepmother said this, Cinderella, you know how hard Anastasia and Drizella worked to get their chores done, but you failed to finish yours. I'm afraid you can't go to the ball. But she went anyway. And the moral of the story is, kids, Cinderella was a defiant, rebellious, disrespectful woman that no one should be like. The end. Okay, are your gears grinding in your head? Okay. How many of you, I need a show of hands, how many of you know the story of Cinderella before I told you? (laughs) Hands up, hands up. You know what? Disney released this movie in 1950. It's older than most of us in here. I know some of you are older than that, and that's okay. You don't have, I'm older than Cinderella. You don't have to raise your hand, Okay. They released this movie in 1950, and even if you haven't seen this movie, I bet you've read the book, and if you haven't read the book, you at least know the story, because you know the big picture. None of you in here are Cinderella illiterate, okay? Now, if you know the story of Cinderella, then how I've twisted it or cherry-picked a quote from her stepmother isn't going to mess you up, is it? Did it? Okay. Now, if I only read to you quotes from Cinderella's stepmother, then you would probably get the wrong picture about Cinderella, wouldn't you? So it doesn't matter what quote I give to you from the story because you know the big picture, right? I I can't fool you. I tried, but I can't. Now listen, if you know what God's word says then you will not fall for every stupid thing that is out there. Okay? Many people don't know God's word. They don't read it. They don't think it's important. And they they fall two ways. One, they see things that that shame them from non-Christians. Non-Christians throw a verse at them. And that shames them and it weakens their faith because they don't know what the Bible says. Big picture. Okay? And secondly, well-meaning Christians have twisted scriptures. And when you fall for those, just like when you fall in real life, you can get hurt. And so it's my job to make sure that none of y'all get hurt. Okay? All right, so lastly, we're going to talk about Proverbs. Not every proverb is a promise. Now, when you think of the word proverb, I think we usually think of the Bible or some kind of spiritual book, um, you know, an ancient Chinese proverb. But the truth is that we have proverbs even in our modern world. They have nothing to do with the Bible. We just don't call them proverbs, but they are proverbs. And so... I'm going to show you some easy-to-spot proverbs in our modern day so that you go, okay, okay, and hopefully it will help uh, to solidify this point. Here's, in our traffic system, I see a lot of proverbs. Here's the first one. Drive sober or get pulled over. Now, we are new creations in Christ Jesus, and there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And, but some of you are, are old enough to know that the stigma of drunk driving has drastically skyrocketed since the 70s, right? Oh, yeah. 
It's continually, steadily climbed. How many of you do not raise your hand, have seen people drive away, your friends, I gotta get out of here, you know, that you've seen a long time ago drive off drunk and you didn't think twice about it. I mean, you can look at old things. We, we were very dangerous in the past. Kids jumping around on the back seats, you know. We just weren't that safe, okay? But some people have driven all the way home and never gotten pulled over drunk, right? Or how about vice versa? How about the converse of that? How many of you have never, ever driven drunk? You've always driven sober, yet you still got pulled over, <laughs> right? Okay, here's the next one. Click it or ticket. Click it or ticket. How many of you know somebody that has driven continuously forgets to buckle the seatbelt and they never get tickets? Okay? So, <laughs> if you didn't notice, my wife raised her hand. Okay. Can I just say something? There is someone that I love a lot, and if I'm driving poorly, and this person that I love so much is in the car with me, it really disturbs me that this person hopes I get pulled over. I've heard this person say, I hope you get pulled over, and here's what boggles my mind. We share the same bank account. So I don't understand why you would hope that we both lose $140. So I will, I will not say who that person is, but I love them a lot, and they drive me crazy. Um, so here's the thing. Click it or ticket. Some people forget to buckle, and, and they go through life, and they never get tickets even when they get pulled over. Like, what is up with this person? They always, the cop lets them off, right? How many of you... Uh, that's, you're the opposite. You're like the person, the one time you accidentally buckle, there's a cop at the edge of your driveway. <laughs> you're trying to do that, right? That's you. But here's the bottom line. It doesn't apply to everyone all the time, correct? Okay, so let me give you one more. And different departments of transportation in different states have different uh, campaigns and different proverbs. Here's one that I found. It says, buckle up, slow down, pay attention, um, arrive alive. Now, we see on the news almost every day people who are doing all of those things and they don't arrive alive. Somebody else crashes into them and shatters their world. Now, as far as I know, there isn't anyone who's advocating that we abolish these modern-day proverbs. There's no one down at the state capitol with placards saying, tear these signs down. These are faith-fueled lies. Right? Why is that? Because um, we understand that these are general principles, right? They're general principles. And proverbs are not formulas for success, but guidelines to finding success, okay? So when you do something like, hey, I do this, this, and this, and it doesn't happen, there's always outliers. There's always other factors. But, but we shouldn't get rid of these things, should we? No. So Proverbs focus on the general rule and not the exception. So you need to understand that a proverb is not a promise, but a principle, okay? And so, again, right now, I just want to let you know, I told you this a year ago when we preached. I said, you don't have to agree with everything the pastor says. I'm just letting you know, you don't have to agree with this point, okay? What's most important is whether you believe in the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross and you believe in him as your Savior because in 10,000 years, this message isn't going to matter. What I'm saying on this point will not matter, okay? That doesn't mean you should stop listening now. Oh, it's not even going to matter. I should stop listening. But what I'm saying is this particular point, you can disagree with me on. You could even think that I'm wrong. And pastors can be wrong about stuff, 
okay? You might think that I'm wrong in my fashion choices. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. And I hope that I can still be your pastor, even if I'm wrong. Is that okay? There's some kinds of wrong you don't want that guy to be your pastor, okay? This is something that I hope you can go, you know what? I disagree, but I'm still going to let you be my pastor. Because um, I'm telling you that if you read your Bible, okay, and you don't want to get hurt, you don't want to get hurt by it or upset or confused by twisting the scriptures, then you need to understand that a proverb is a principle and not necessarily a promise, okay? Listen, Proverbs 10, 27, the fear of the Lord makes your life long and the wicked are cut short, okay? Sometimes bad people live long lives. They do. Um, Fidel Castro was 91 when he passed away, and he ruled like with an iron fist in Cuba. He jailed dissidents, uh, messed with the church right and left. I think he was a bad person. We're known by our fruits. Another person we're known by our fruits Hugh Hefner died, 91. He caused a lot of bad things to happen. And I think that he did bad. He did bad. Now, how many of you know someone who's lived a long and luxurious life, yet they seem so wicked? We all know those people. Or the other way, how many of you know someone that loved the Lord and their lives were cut short? But if you twist every proverb into a promise, okay, and then you hold God to it, right, if you do that, then Jesus' own lifespan discredits this proverb, okay? Jesus was sinless. He only lived to be 33. How many of you are older than 33? Okay, yeah. His life was literally cut short. In fact, Isaiah the prophet prophesies about Jesus or the Messiah. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8, he says something very similar about the Messiah Referring to Jesus, he was cut off from the land of the living, okay? Don't you think that if anyone deserved to live a very, very light, long life on this planet, it would have been Jesus, right? So when you're reading these verses that are meant to be principles, okay, please don't twist them into, into promises because they can hurt you. And I'll show you how in the next verse here. But... One other thing is when you're reading these and you're saying these are promises, what you're doing is literally not just twisting the scripture, but you're trying to twist God's hand and saying, you have to do this. You have to do this. I, I wouldn't recommend being in that position, you know. So this verse I want to uh, read to you is a verse that sometimes we twist. It says, raise a child the way they should go, and when they're older, they will not depart. Well, let me tell you something. Sometimes they don't go that way. Sometimes they do depart. Now, one of modern Christianity's greatest teachers, okay, within the past like 50 years, his name is Francis Schaeffer. He died in 1984, and I know his name isn't a household name, okay? But for people who defend the faith and like to write things for uh, postmoderns and try to explain Christianity to postmoderns, this guy is the one. He started this in the 50s. He started this place called Labrie in Switzerland, and people from all over the world came to learn from him. He and his wife were on fire for Jesus. He is like an apologist, apologist, like, like Leonard Cohen. And you go, who? Leonard Cohen is like a musician's musician. Nobody knows him, but everybody sings his songs. Hallelujah, hallelujah, right? Like, oh, that's, that's, you don't even know that guy, right? This guy is a theologian's theologian. He's an apologist's apologist. And other people who are in this, they look to this guy. He was on fire for Jesus, he and his wife. They had one son, named him Frank. His name's Frank Schaefer. You can look him up. He, he likes to identify himself as a Christian atheist, Okay, it happens. It happens, right? Here's what I want you to know. Moms and dads, listen to me. This verse was never meant to be a club to hit yourself over the head with when your kid is not doing anything that you told him. When little Johnny is out on his own and nothing, he, nothing you've told him he's applying to his life. Nothing. 
this verse isn't meant to bring you all kinds of guilt and condemnation. Like, I didn't pray enough. I, what did we do wrong? And parents struggle with this because they twist this into a promise. And it's not working. It's not working. So you need to be, re- you need to be released from the burden of guilt and shame that comes from twisting this scripture into a promise. And you can pray, you know what, God, I did the best that I could, which wasn't very good, but I placed them in your hands, period. You can get hurt if you twist Proverbs into promises. Now, is it more likely that God is a liar and his word is untrue or that Proverbs were never meant to be promises, but rather principles to live by? Okay, so you have those two options, not trying to paint a false choice there, but There isn't a whole lot of options. So I think about Billy Graham. You know, he he was laid to rest this week, and his son uh, officiated in the the funeral. And his son, Franklin, departed for a while from his dad. He even wrote a book about it called Rebel with a Cause. Now, his son has since come back, okay? And now his son uh, created a ministry that we are involved heavily in. Samaritan's Purse, at Christmas time, we do Operation Christmas Child. And so um, this verse here, okay, I, I, I don't want you to feel like I'm, I'm not trying to ruin anybody's, you know, perception of, you know, lots of people know this verse. And they say, this is the verse, I'm standing on this promise. Okay, but when your kid isn't doing what they're supposed to do, okay, or how about this? Some of us got saved after our our kids became adults and already moved out. So does this verse now mean that those kids are doomed because you didn't raise them up in the way they should have gone? No, no. So with that, I'm going to pray for us.